Okay, guys. Uh, so, what we're going to do in this uh, relatively shorter video compared to the SN1 video is we're going to talk about E1 reactions. Okay. Now, uh, please realize that E1 and SN1 compete with each other. Uh, they both involve alkyl halides in in solvents which are weak nucleophiles and weak electrophiles and uh, so there are some similarities in their mechanisms in fact there is overlap okay overlap between their mechanisms to some extent and uh, now that we've done SN1 reactions E1 should be relatively easier to understand because E1 uh, has some overlap with uh, SN1 reaction and it has some overlap with an E2 reactions. So if you understand both of those, E1 should be relatively easy. So uh, for E1 reactions, <clears throat> what we'll do here is we will basically start with the same examples that we talked about earlier, but the rate of the reaction uh, of an E1 reaction, again, just depends on the concentration of the alkyl halide. Okay, uh, so similar, uh, uh, the rate law is identical to an SN1 reaction. Okay, uh, so we'll go back to this example that we used for, in fact, we'll go back to one or two examples that we used in the SN1 video and see how the E1 products are formed. So let's say we start with this algal halide. We have alpha carbon here. What we know is if we heat this with methanol, uh, this would give us a substitution product plus an elimination product. Okay, this is SN1 product. This is an E1 product. Okay, now for both, again, I just want to reiterate some of these things, okay? Our nucleophile or our base is a solvent, which is a weak nucleophile, weak base, okay? That's what we have. And then I think I want to point out some, uh, some easier ways to, like, some easy ways to identify what's going on here. So if you look at the SN1 product, essentially what happened is we removed the halogen from that alpha carbon attached the solvent minus its proton. So we took away that proton, okay, this proton in methanol. We basically removed that proton and we attached the rest of that solvent to that alpha carbon through that oxygen because that is the nucleophilic site in our solvent. That is what happened in an SN1 product, okay? So this is alpha, this is still alpha the solvent stat. Now, as far as elimination products are concerned, we should bring in our beta because going to that product, what happened is we lost a beta hydrogen. That is, so we're missing the H beta and we are missing the halogen. And that's why we get a double bond between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. So we already saw the mechanism that leads to this SN1 product. What we're going to do in this video is talk about the mechanism of how that E1 product is formed. So mechanistically, again, like I said, there is overlap between SN1 and E1 mechanisms. So the first step here is again, an ionization. Okay, so ionization, you have that alkyl halide, alpha, beta, and the halogen loses as a halide or the molecule ionizes to give us a carbocation at the alpha carbon plus the bromide, okay? That's our first step. And since this we're talking about elimination, that H beta is really important, okay? So first step, similar to an E1 or SN1 reaction. 
second step has some similarities to an E2 reaction. So once this carbocation is formed, what happens in the second step is we have carbocation at the alpha carbon. This is our beta carbon. That's our hydrogen on the beta carbon. One of the hydrogens, realize there are three hydrogens and just drawing out one of them. One of the hydrogens on the beta carbon. Water, sorry, methanol here in this particular case. which is our solvent is a weak base. So what that does is after the carbocation is formed, it will go and deprotonate. So this is a deprotonation step. So deprotonation of H beta by solvent. That's what this step is about. So Solvent goes and deprotonates H beta. Electrons between the beta carbon and the beta hydrogen drop into the space between alpha and beta. And that gives us a double bond between alpha and beta plus a protonated methanol molecule. Now, which again is our byproduct here. I missed it out in this scenario, okay? So in that scheme, I missed it out, but the methanol is formed and realize that this is a side product or a byproduct that's formed from our SN1 reaction. And now it's also formed from our E1 reaction. So the only step where E1 is different from SN1 is the second step, the deprotonation step. Okay, so E1 is strictly two steps. In the second step, we've already made our product. So that's the mechanism of an E1 reaction. First, an ionization to form a carbocation, then deprotonation of a beta hydrogen to give us the alkene product, okay? So that's one example. Uh, let's go ahead, look at the other example where we had a couple of products forming because, again, because uh, elimination involves the beta hydrogen, so whenever there is more than one beta hydrogen or more than one beta carbons, then we have to basically engage all of them in the formation of our products. So let's go to this other example where we had this chiral alpha, chiral at alpha alkyl halide. So that's our alpha. And when we react or heat this with water, which is a weak solvent, weak base, and this is again another example that I used in the SN1 uh, video. And I think it is basically coming from the textbook. When we do that, what we saw is we make this plus its enantiomer, which are the SN1 products. And again, I want to point out, notice how we get the SN1 product. We remove that bromine from that alpha carbon and the solvent lost one of its protons, two protons on the oxygen, we lost one of the protons, and the rest of it is connected to that alpha carbon through that oxygen atom, okay? To the alpha, through the oxygen atom, whatever is the nucleophilic site, that is what's connected to that. And then along with this, we get a bunch of elimination products because what we had was we had the E alkene, then we had the Z alkene, which are both disubstituted, and then we have monosubstituted products. So those are all E1 products. So what we're going to do here is look at the mechanism for formation of the E1 products. How do we get those products, okay? How do we get those products? And again, in this particular case, we have one alpha carbon and we have a beta carbon and what I'm going to call a beta prime carbon. So like in E2, so similar to E2, if there, are more than, if there is more than one beta carbon, then you have to track all of those to get your products for elimination reactions. And so mechanistically, in terms of mechanism, What is happening over here is we have our first step, 
bromine. That's our alpha carbon. Bromine ionizes and realize that there is a hydrogen here. With heat, and we get hydrogen. We have alpha over there, and plus we've got bromide. Okay, so we've got the, sorry, this is the alpha carbon, but we've got a carbocation now at the alpha carbon. So we've made that carbocation. Now, what we saw in SN1 reactions is when the nucleophile comes and attacks that carbocation, we get our substitution products. This is elimination. So we have to focus on the beta hydrogens. So H beta and H beta prime. Okay, so those are our two beta hydrogens. And so have this carbon, carbocation at alpha, and then we have H beta. This is beta, beta prime, beta, beta prime, beta, beta prime. We have H beta prime. And so now the carbocations there, second step, again, the solvent, which is a weak base shows up, okay? It is there in the second step. And the solvent can now go and deprotonate H beta. It can deprotonate H beta. And the electrons from this bond drop into the space between alpha and beta. Or the solvent could deprotonate H beta prime and the electrons from that bond drop into the space between alpha and beta prime, alpha and beta prime in that particular case. And what that's going to give us is a double bond between alpha and beta. And this double bond could be trans or it could be cis. This is also alpha and beta plus it's going to give us a double bond between alpha and beta prime. So we get all of our elimination products. And again, like I pointed out earlier, the major product is going to be among the elimination products. The major product is going to be this trans di substituted alkene. That is a mono substituted alkene. This is a cis disubstituted alkene. So between all three of them, the trans disubstituted alkene is going to be the major product. So that's basically the mechanism of how we get to these three E1 products. Okay. Uh, and so basically what you have to do is similar to E2, identify all your beta carbons, identify all beta hydrogens, and then make an alkene from each of those beta carbons, okay? You're going to put a double bond between the alpha and every beta that's possible. And keep in mind that sometimes you could have cis and trans alkenes, both possible, okay? If there is a rearrangement possible, then realize that you will get new products. So one of the examples in the SN1 video involves a rearrangement. So please go ahead, work through a mechanism to that. I'm actually going to work out a problem that's in the textbook. Okay, to show you how would we use this information about SN1 and E1 combined, okay? So we're going to talk about SN1 and E1, what products are possible, but the mechanism of E1 itself is that much, it is simple compared to like, now that we know SN1 and E2, I think the mechanism of E1 is relatively simple to understand. So SN1, and E1 reactions, okay? Uh, so we will look at this, an example, and this example is 7.33B in the textbook. Seven point, let me confirm, 
this is 7.33b in the textbook. And what we have to do is we have to draw, we have to draw all possible products from this reaction, whatever products are possible. Okay, now again, in this particular case, what I see is a tertiary alkyl halide, weak nucleophile, weak base with heat. That's hint that we are talking about an SN1 and E1 reaction. And there's no way to tease these apart. So that means they're going to be together. They'll be happening simultaneously. Okay, so what sort of products can we expect? To do that, you have to first analyze your starting material, the alkyl halide. So for this alkyl halide, that's my alpha carbon, the one connected to the halogen. And what I notice is the molecule is symmetric. So this is beta, this is also beta, and this is beta prime. So it looks like there are two beta positions, beta and beta prime, because these are identical. And the beta and the beta primes are unique. So those are our positions, because that's the sort of analysis that I want to do. Because uh, I have to think about, uh, is there a rearrangement possible here? Okay, so when I look at the alpha carbon, that is tertiary, okay? Alpha is tertiary, beta prime is primary, and beta is secondary. And when the carbocation rearranges, realize that it ranges from a less stable to a more stable carbocation. And in the mechanism of this reaction, which I would encourage you to actually draw it out, okay, please draw it out. In my mechanism for this reaction, I would make a tertiary carbocation because the carbocation is formed at the alpha carbon. So I'll make a tertiary carbocation. And then next to it, there are secondary positions or primary positions. So this carbocation is not going to rearrange. So that way I can rule out any possibility for carbocation rearrangement. Now, tertiary carbocations can rearrange to more stable carbocations, which are benzylic and allylic actually, okay? So look through the textbook in chapter six, it actually discusses those actually. So benzylic and allylic carbocations, which are resonance stabilized are more stable than tertiary. But in this case, that's not going to happen. So with that, I can start drawing my product. So for substitution, uh, as I pointed out earlier in this video, for substitution, what happens is the halogen is lost from the alpha carbon the nucleo the solvent gets connected or attached to that alpha carbon through that oxygen minus a hydrogen. So it's going to lose one proton and get connected to that carbon. So that means my product here is going to be this. That is an SN1 product. And there is no chiral center in this molecule, so I don't have to worry about enantiomers here. So that is the only SN1 product I will get. And plus, I'm going to get E1 products from every unique beta, beta position. So one E1 product is going to be this, where the double bond is formed between alpha and beta. Now I could put the double bond down because that's also another beta position. So it doesn't matter where I put the double bond. And then I'm going to have another product where the double bond is between alpha and beta prime. So those are all the products that are possible from this reaction. These are E1 products. All three of them are going to be formed in this reaction. Okay. Now, I quickly want to show you what happens if I change the solvent. Okay. And along with that, I want to show you some other things uh, which could cause confusion. So let's say instead of water, I react this molecule with ETOH. What is this? This is ET stands for ethyl group. So this is ethanol. Now realize that ethanol can be written in several ways. I could write it as ETOH or I could write it as 
CH3, CH2, OH. Or I could write it as C2, H5, OH. Or I could draw it like this. All of these are representations for ethanol for the same molecule. So now, since we know Lewis structures, bond line structures, condensed structural formulas, things like that, we have to understand that this is all the same. We have to be able to identify the molecule, okay? So that's all going back to chapter one and everything. So, anyway, so these all represent the same molecule. So what happens if you, instead of water as the solvent, you do this reaction in ethanol as the solvent? Okay, uh, again, substitution wise, alpha, the halogen would be replaced by the solvent minus a proton. Now the proton is lost from that nucleophilic site. So in all of these molecules, they're all ethanol. The nucleophile is this oxygen because the oxygen uses its lone pair. So it's, the oxygen here used its lone pair and a proton from that oxygen is lost. That's why we got hydroxyl. That means in this particular case, our SN1 product is going to be, I can write it several ways. It's going to be O, CH2, CH3. That's a bond line structure. Or I could write it as O, ET, any of these are OCH2CH3 or OC2H5. All of those representations are for the same molecule. Okay, I'm not writing out everything, but these would all be SN1 products. Now, in addition to those, we're going to make elimination products. But the elimination products, notice here the elimination product does not show anything from the solvent or the nucleophile, which means whether it is water or ethanol, that does not change. So our elimination products are going to be the same as we have there. That's what our elimination products would be. So these would all be the products from this reaction. So E1 products, the E1 products that are formed these are independent of the solvent that is used. But substitution products, as in one products, those depend on the solvent that we are using. Okay, so that's a solved example. So hope that kind of helps you think about these problems as you work through this. And again, it is getting complicated day by day. So the only way to stay on top of it is to actually practice problems. Just keep practicing as much homework as you possibly can. Okay. And with every problem that you work on, it should get easier and easier. Okay. So uh, to conclude this video here, uh, I want to discuss two other attributes of SN1 and E1 reactions. And these both deal with the relative reactivity of alkyl halides, okay? Which means which alkyl halide reacts the fastest, which one reacts the slowest, that, okay? So for these reactions, the relative reactivity of the alkyl halide, and we will look at two aspects of this, is determined, one of the things is it is determined by the stability of the carbocation formed during ionization, okay? More formation of a more stable 
carbocation results in a faster reaction. So essentially what we're saying is, as far as SN1 and E1 reactions are concerned, the rate determining step is the ionization step, where the alkyl halide becomes the carbocation. So if a more stable carbocation is formed in that step, then the reaction is going to be faster. So the stability of the carbocation determines how fast the reaction is going to go. And so that should help us think about which alkyl halide is going to react the fastest. A uh, more stable carbocation would give us a better reaction, and that is actually determined the alkyl halide. So what that means is tertiary alkyl halides, these react the fastest, okay? They react faster than secondary, which react than primary, and then methyl. In fact, this is mostly a reaction of tertiary and secondary alkyl halides, okay? They do this reaction uh, because you make a tertiary carbocation or a secondary carbocation. And tertiary carbocation being the most stable, tertiary alkyl halides react the fastest in this reaction, okay? So that's one aspect of this reaction. So tertiary greater than secondary, greater than primary. So uh, in some sense, this is the same as E2 because in E2 also, tertiary is faster than secondary, which is greater than faster, faster than primary, and then metals are the, well, metals don't do it. And the reason there is different though. It depends on the stability of the alkene. Here, it's the stability of the carbocation. Okay, that's one aspect of it. The second thing about alkyl halides uh, is that uh, the relative reactivity is determined by the ease of ionization, which basically is a bond breaking during or oh, not during, in the rate determining step, the RDS, which is the first step. So that means if you can break that bond easily, then the reaction should be faster. And in this particular case, okay, because uh, by the ease of ionization or bond breaking during the rate determining step, that means uh, if there is a weaker bond, it's going to break easily, which means it will give us a faster reaction, okay? Uh, now this would apply to a case where we are comparing, let's say, alkyl iodide, no, this is a tertiary alkyl iodide compared to a tertiary alkyl bromide to a tertiary alkyl chloride. Now the alkyl halide is tertiary in all cases and the only thing that's different is the halogen. And in this particular case, the reactivity is iodides, they react faster than the bromides and the chlorides. That's because this bond here is the weakest bond, okay? So because of that, uh, when we are comparing similar alkyl iodides, tertiary, 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 with different halogens on them, then the alkyl iodides, they react faster compared to alkyl bromides and alkyl chloride okay that's the order uh, yeah and then uh, and then and then realize that like I said earlier uh, uh, allylic and benzylic halides 
they react faster than tertiary also because those carbocations are resonance stabilized. So that's something to keep in mind. So I think that's everything that we want to cover in E1 and SN1. So I'm going to stop this video here. Uh, there's a little bit more that we want to discuss in uh, chapter seven. Uh, these are E2 and E1 reactions with uh, molecules that behave like alkyl halides, but they are not alkyl halides. So we'll discuss that. Okay. Uh, that would be upcoming in the next video. So we'll stop right here. Bye.